going to move on to our next panel, which is our own worst enemies, which is a term that I've heard used multiple times this morning, so it seems like a topic that we're ready to hear about. Um, our moderator today I'm delighted to have here is Carol H. Williams, who is a true legend in our business. Um, She's a pioneer, that's the word that comes to mind. Um, she owns her own agency, Carol H. Williams, that she founded two decades ago um, to address the African American market. And she was actually the first female creative director and the first African American creative director at Leo Burnett in Chicago. So she's a woman that we need to talk to. So she's coming up for our own worst enemies. Well, good afternoon, is it noon? Oh, what? Good morning, late morning ladies, how are you? You know what? I like football. <laughs> and if you watch the football, you'll see, you know, I like the guys when they, they dance in the end zone and do all those things and knock the hell out of people and all that wonderful stuff. And there'd be clips where uh, somebody would be running in the end zone, dancing, shooting the football over the goalpost like it's a basketball, and doing all kind of crazy stuff. And all of a sudden, there's a shot of Vince Lombardi, and he's storming up and down the, the sidelines, and he yells, what the hell is going on out there? And that's what we're going to find out today. <laughs> what the hell is going on out there? As this conversation has been going on for a very, very long time, we have been in it discussing women in business. And God, it's like uh, Carol is a pioneer. I don't like that. <laughs> Tell me I'm old. <laughs> I want to be a butt kicker. And that's right. I want to come in and do the things that we need to do. But let's get on with it. I want to, let me just say first, I want to introduce you or uh, bring up on the stage all those brilliant women that got me up here with all these PhDs. I'm really feeling not good about this. And uh, so let's bring them up on the stage. Come on, ladies. I'm going to take a minute to introduce them uh, one by one, but one of the things I want to tell you, I am a creative, been a creative all my life. I didn't know it. I, I found it out when I was about in kindergarten, and um, they had me on the stage to say a, uh, a uh, speech, and my mother had me dressed up in this wonderful little pink dress with pink bows on it, and I was just, just so marvelous. And, and I was standing there, and I was getting ready to do my speech. And I looked out in the audience, and it was just all these faces out there. So I reached down and pulled this dress up over my head. <laughs> and I said my entire speech to the dress. And that my, my instructor said, she's very creative. <laughs> so just remember, ladies, how do you make it in advertising? Pull your dress up. You'll be all right. <laughs> so. Um, we, when we were, um, when I first came into advertising, quite honestly, my, one of my first assignments was uh, a feminine hygiene product. And uh, when I walked in the room to work on this product, I was the only right over female, not to mention black and a woman, and there was a room full of men, and they had the sanitary pad, <laughs> and they were manipulating this pad and 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 it was the one that some of you may not remember but uh, you know they had the tail on they had two tails on it so you could hook it over <laughs> you could hook it over stuff you know and 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 the and the guys were they had created this campaign and and the tail and the thing was vertical and the top of the thing was, it was the hair, and the bottom of the thing was the fishtail, the other tail was the fishtail dress, and it had legs and it had stiletto heels on, and it had big red lipstick lips on it, and it danced. 
And they were just really excited and it was dancing. And I was staring at it and they said, well, what's the matter? I said, it's moving. <laughs> they went down, it's dancing. I said, no, it's moving. I don't, I don't, I don't want the pad to move. <laughs> Well, they instantly decided my IQ was very low. <laughs> now you know what I was talking about, and they took this thing to test. And guess what women told them? <laughs> it's moving. <laughs> that, in essence, sums up why it's so important for us to be in this business. Because 80% of the things that's bought come through the gates through us. But there are certain things I think we need to know in order to make sure that we really solidify and be really smart about how we manage this labyrinth, this, this thing that's called advertising, which really is, guys, a lot of fun. Yes, it's a lot of work, but take it from me, who've been doing it almost 40 years, is a ball. It, I've had a great time and would not give it up for anything. So let us go and weigh in on this discussion. The goal of our session is to answer these questions, identify new insights into the leadership differs for how leadership differs for women than it does for men, and how to navigate these new solutions and ideas. Let us first meet Lori and McKenzie. Lori is, uh, Lori is director at Clayman Institute for Gender Research, Stanford University. Her topic fo focus would be uh, gender research. Next, I'd like you to meet Dr. Lauren Tucker. <laughs> Dr. Tucker is a senior vice president, director of consumer forensics. Uh, from the Martin Agency, her topic focus is dissecting and translating uh, perceptions of the gender research and revelations of these findings. Next, can we meet Dr. Barbara Mark? <laughs> Dr. Mark is a PhD and CEO and founder of the Full Circle Institute. Her topic focus is leadership skills. And lastly, and not least, Christy Cordes. <laughs> Christy is a CEO and founder of Ad Recruiter. Topic focus will be career development and transferring this knowledge into the workforce. Okay, we have, we're gonna power through a lot of this, but first I wanna go to, uh, uh, to Ms. McKenzie and um, want you to share with us the research on the ways in which we view leadership, and also what about the structural barriers to women's leadership, um, or how leadership is framed so that women often face a harsher, higher standard? Thank you. So I actually come to research not as a researcher, but at, with a brand background. And I remember when I was uh, the MBA wonk from Cincinnati coming out to Santa Monica to take over the advertising for the Giorgio business. I realized the creative uh, agencies, the guy, his job was to prove that we MBA wonks didn't really understand beauty. And I took it personally. And I think the highest role of the research that I'm going to present today is to help move what might feel like some personal reasons why we don't have success out to look at the structural barriers that women face and stay-at-home men, that people who are outside the norms face when they're taking on something with the hope that you can take that structure and then apply it to your success and the su success of others. The first thing I want to talk about are how perceptions shape outcomes. A lot of times we think perceptions shape thoughts, but what research shows is that perceptions shape real world, world outcomes, real disadvantaging outcomes. And often when we hear this, we think those perceptions must be malicious and have ill intent. In fact, they don't. They're unconscious. There's a great project out of Harvard, the Implicit Association Project. You can take the test online yourself, 
and see that regardless of how much you are an advocate, you actually will score in ways that surprise you. And I love that the researcher, Malcolm Gladwell, the author in Blink, wrote that he took this test, and despite having African-American blood, he kind of scored in some ways that weren't very positive for people of his own race. So it's not that we're doing this intentionally, and it's not that there's malicious intent. Understanding how society shapes opportunities and platforms can be very empowering for us to find solutions that work not just to fix us as individuals, but to understand what is out of our control and therefore we can actually find ways to succeed. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about this question. And I'm supposed to roll it, so I'm gonna see if this is rolling. The thing on the side, there. So what is the perception of a creative director? You think, I'm walking in to get new business. I'm smart, I'm talented, I'm creative. What are they expecting there in the audience? The same for leaders. With 97% in all the imagery around leadership, something that's very assertive, in their heads before you enter the door. Oh, I clicked too much. Okay, so I'm clearly having a technical difficulty. <laughs> so I'm trying to go back to the, oh, I went to the end. So rolling, I'm not rolling with it, can you tell? <laughs> they said, just roll, I can roll, okay. If she so was a man, she'd be able to do yeah. this. <laughs> hey, I figured it out without any help. There you go. So, but I can't recall which way to move it. So before you walk in the door, they have this picture in their mind of the ideal creative director. Same with the leader. You hear, I'm gonna hear the president of whatever company speak. Who is that person you're picturing in your mind? Are you doing that maliciously or is it just the way that these perceptions have been shaped? You walk in the door, you're smart, you're talented, you've got great ideas. In their heads, who do they have as the ideal creative director? Okay, so this is what we're walking into. I want to give an example from science. Jennifer alluded to it. Why is it the case, not just with women creative directors, but why is it that we have so few scientists? This is a really great test that was designed in 1983. 5,000 school children, unaided, draw me a scientist. Who do they draw? In 1983, 28 children out of 5,000 drew a female scientist. That means when we think about a scientist, who we're looking for is that smart guy. Notice in 1983, he has glasses. He looks a little bit kind of geeky. Today, there's a little more diversity in who we see. The women almost always have glasses, and maybe the women are more naturalists. They're not lab scientists. So we've evolved who we think of as scientists a little. But still, when you walk into a room, this is exactly who you're expecting to be the best scientist. So the question I will ask too is, do women scientists stand an equal chance of achieving the role of lab manager? The study that uh, Jennifer referred to just came out of Yale. What they did is they took two one-page summaries, one for Jennifer, one for job, John, otherwise identical, took them to six research institutes, three private, three public, and they just asked these professors rather quickly, they didn't want them talking to their colleagues, to evaluate Jennifer or John, they only got one resume, to see who would make a better lab manager. This is the way perceptions shape outcome, literally zero difference in their application. What we see, out of a score of seven, John gets a four, Jennifer gets a 3.3. What's really interesting about this study, they're not outstanding candidates. They have promise, but they're not stellar. So we're not talking about the 1%, we're talking about pretty average people. Even amongst pretty average candidates, John is being offered almost $5,000 more as a starting salary. And when asked, will you mentor this candidate, who do they pick? John is getting the mentoring, Jennifer is not. So this is the way, think of that, a harmless picture drawn about a scientist with 5,000 children. What do we see 30 years later? We see the outcome is that people are picking John. Now, does this mean, well, perhaps, perhaps John really would make a better lab manager. How do we know that's not what's happening here? 
How many of you have heard about the blind auditions for orchestras? It's really, really remarkable, right? So what happens is these women out of Princeton looked at orchestras where there are only 10% women in the orchestra. What's really fascinating about it is there are these perceptions that men really did have larger lungs, they held the instruments in stronger ways, perhaps they really were better <laughs> instrument players. What they discovered is that if you put a blind up and the woman is sitting behind it, they increase their chance of progressing to the next round by 50%. And in fact, over 30 years, the number of women in orchestras went from 10% to 30%. So I dismissed the argument that John would make a better lab manager. What I discovered, what we can discover is this. The clearer the selection criteria, the less these biases can creep in. If you think about selection committees, there's also this amazing study, I'm not gonna go into it, where they looked at a fire chief, two identical resumes, the female fire chief and the male. They switched them. One had more experience, one had more education. When the woman had more education, they said, we need a fire chief with experience. When the male had more education, they said, we need a fire chief with more education. Not done intentionally, we are inadvertently fixing the criteria in our head to match who we think the ideal candidate is. So if you are looking at candidates, make sure the selection criteria is very clear before you evaluate, so that if you see this bias going on implicitly, not overtly, you can say, gee, Jennifer had more experience, isn't that what we said? If you're walking into a client, you can also say, you know, depending on how, how it goes, what are your selection criteria for your agency? And if they say a proven track record and you see that the person male dominated is not with a proven track record, there may be a way to bring it up. So this is ways where I hope the research moves what feels like a personal issue, Jennifer didn't get as much money, to the structural implicit bias, to solution, let's fix the criteria. And I think this, at least for me, would have empowered me when I was a brand manager to realize this had nothing to do with me but there was something I could do knowing it wasn't that I just had to get better, smarter, or faster. So that was the first answer to the question. Um, do you want me to go into the second yes, answer? Yes, okay. absolutely. The second question I was asked to address is, do women leaders face a harsher standard? Or why don't we like women leaders? And I think we've heard a little bit of it today, right? Are we bitches, are we this, are we that? So let's, let's take it on with the research. I'm just gonna talk about Hewlett Packard. I'm not gonna evaluate what they did for the business. I wanna look at two, how two Hewlett Packard CEOs left the business. When Carly Fiorina left Hewlett Packard, it was written up in the newspapers, ding dong, the witch is dead. When Mark Hurd, who had an affair, was, had ta fooled with the taxes, had all sorts of discrimination, when he left, what happened? Oracle said, that was the worst personnel decision you ever made and they hired him. Is this just because they happen to be different kinds of business leaders or is something else going on? Frank Flynn, who taught at Columbia, he's now at the Stanford Business School, did a little experiment. He took this business school case about Heidi Rosen, a very successful entrepreneur. Interestingly, she was successful because she was amazing at networking. She networked at preschool, she networked at the supermarket. She ne you name it, she networked, she succeeded. When the students rated the case, they thought they were both equally competent. Whether the entrepreneur was named Howard, whether she was named Heidi, equally competent. However, nobody liked Heidi. Do you think this matters? Heidi was called power hungry. People wanted to work for Howard. What a likable guy. They also said, Frank said, the more aggressive she was rated by an individual, the more they disliked her. This is called by some the double blind. <clears throat> Women leaders face this double blind. The more competent you occur, the less likable you seem. Now this isn't universal, thank goodness. Um, hopefully we can be both. Um, the thing is, men do not face this double blind. Think about a very successful CEO. 
don't you kind of trust him more if you know he takes his son out to a baseball game or that he volunteers at a soup kitchen? You, you actually trust them more as a business leader. Women are constantly fighting this double bind. If I am likable at the wrong times, I'm seen as incompetent. You can kind of almost see this in the presidential candidates. Everyone hated Hillary and thought that Susan pa Sarah Palin was a bitch. Well, a ditz. Well, I, I don't want to talk about their politics, but it was so easy just to categorize them into these without even thinking about maybe they have a brain in there, maybe they have something to say. They didn't even get to the table. Um, this starts from how we type leaders. Males fit more into the type that we consider leadership. Assertive, um, willing to ask those hard questions. Women fit a little bit more into the nurturing type. That's our expectations, it's how we describe men and women. Then you look at how we treated Carly Fiorina who acted in that dominant male way. <coughs> Nobody liked her. In fact, they said, when women behave in dominant ways, they are seen as unlikable because they violate norms of feminine niceness. Now, does this mean that we can never succeed? No, actually, a recent study came out of the Graduate Business School at Stanford. They studied business school students over eight years and tracked their careers. They found that women who can actually figure out when to play the masculine and when to play the feminine are more successful and get even more promotions than masculine men. So women who can both be assertive and know when to be collegial outperform even masculine men. What does this mean? It means that we need to figure out how not to become men, but to figure out when to play which side of the field. And one thing that I find very interesting is that these traits are not inbred, they're not natural, they're actual learned. What they saw is if at the beginning of a career you can help a woman understand when to be assertive and when to be collegial, she will outperform even her male colleagues. And one tip I have about this, if you ever see anything from Deb Grunfeld from the Graduate School of Business, she takes it into acting. There are ways with body language you can act high, act more assertive ways if you notice. Taking up more room when we stand at a podium, don't act like you're trying to get off the stage. However, if you see yourself threatening a colleague, there are ways to rein it in and make sure that you can have the message be heard. So I, I find this very encouraging because it doesn't say that women cannot be leaders and they must be men. It says that if you learn these norms, these structural norms, I'm not saying whether they're good or bad, if you learn them there are ways that women can actually succeed even better than the, the most masculine men. So those are, those are my two points. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant translation, teaching you that alpha dogs are fine. Alpha bitches get in trouble. <laughs> so the next thing is, so, Okay, so we have to stay out for dogs, right? All right. Um, the next question we're going to is Dr. Lauren Tucker on her topic of the dissecting and translating perceptions of gender research and the results and observations of, uh, of her finding. So based on the research articulated, uh, please address some of the perception challenges with female leadership and share some steady results that reveal how women can be their own worst enemies. We got some haters in here. Let's see. Okay, also share a brief, brief description of them. Okay. Um, actually, that was a very complicated title for something that I think <laughs> probably is a lot, probably have a little more, simp uh, more simple presentation of it. Uh, you know, it's interesting being up here. I'm, I'm one of the data geeks. Apparently, though, the data geeks are now the new creative, so take that, you creative directors. <laughs> Um, never thought I'd stand up here and be a creative director. That's it. Um, and it's interesting because I typically am even in more male-dominated roles um, than most folks in advertising. In fact, there are many times when I find myself um, in a room, and if it wasn't for the pervasiveness of, of obesity, I would be the only boobs in the room. So. Um, <laughs> 
it's kind of an interesting position that I'm in, um, and I'm very, so that's why I'm very interested in being here. I, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine, and we were talking about that Nike ad, you know, if you let me, you know, if you let me play. And I was, it, some friend was talking to me about it, and I said, if you let me play. Like that, well, I looked at her and was like, what, what are you talking about, Willis? Um, because when it comes down to leadership, and I know all of us have taken those fun 360s, you know, where you get 5,000 people to evaluate you, and it goes to some company, and they evaluate you against all these people in the nation. What's interesting is you'll see from this data that women actually are evaluated in these 360s. There was like some 60,000 of them were evaluated. They are actually evaluated as better leaders than men. So you know what? We're in the game and we're players. Um, we do very well, but we also have some statistics that worry me. You know, Madeleine Albright talked about there's a special place in hell for women who don't help other women. And I don't know about you all, but I've been there. I was, I was thinking, Carol, that you know, I did my stint at Leo Burnett. And back in the day when you didn't have computers and so forth on your, you know, your desk and your admins, right? your admins helped you type all this stuff. And if they thought you were getting a little uppity, even as a junior planner as I was back then, well, they'd take you down, all right? They would take you down. What's interesting is, is that when women express, women who express a preference, three out of four of them would actually prefer working for men rather than women. Um, I thought that was a pretty surprising interest. Now, 54% of these folks that are in the survey, male, female, didn't have a preference. But of those women who expressed a preference, three out of four of them would rather work for, for a man than a woman. Um, what really bothers me, though, is that this woman-on-woman -woman bullying in the workplace is at 80%. That's up almost 10% from a few years ago. And I remember talking to some colleagues at, at the Martin Agency, some female colleagues at the Martin Agency, and I you know, was talking about, this, hey, admins can take you down. And they were kind of surprised, like, well, wait, a, you know, wait a minute, people, people who are, that you're managing can take you down? Yeah, they can, they can bully you as much as anybody from up top. But we've all also experienced those folks that will push you down because there's this perception, I think, among some women leaders, there's not enough room for all of us. So you can't outshine us. This stuff has to stop. I mean, this is just, this is nonsense. Um, I mentor about 35 folks around the Martin Agency, of which the majority of them are women. And I'm busy as everybody else. I've got a lot of stuff going on. I'm like a one-armed paper hanger in my office. But the bottom line is I have time to help these women get ahead. And you know what? I have to help them learn, right? That's another part of this, helping them learn. Don't dismiss them because they aren't as talented as you think they should be. It may just be a matter of knowledge. Um, I thought this was an interesting quote where Barbara Bush was talking to, was doing her, her commencement speech at Wellesley. The only way this quote works is if everybody kind of still plays in that code, right? There's a code that says, hey, that spouse should have been a woman and the president should be a man, but she's making that joke and that's how we all get it, right? It's about that code. Um, and we've got to also crack the code of our expectations. I, Kat, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm going to call you out here. I don't want to be a Donna Draper. I want to be a Peggy Olson. Okay? That's the woman who is cracking the code. All right? That's, that's what I mean by cracking the code. You know, images of leadership, I'm going to talk about it in, this, in these terms. You remember the term, you know, familiarity breeds contempt? For me, I have contempt for that kind of familiarity. And we need to start cracking the code of what we expect out of leadership. And, what, and whether leadership is male or female, et cetera. Leadership is leadership, and women are doing very well at it. We are in the game. We are playing the game. And as I say to my Martin colleagues, who are many of them who are here, we are players. It's now time to change the game, to be Peggy Olson. Forget about anything named Draper. Um, but we've got to do that in order to succeed, or otherwise we are our own worst enemies first. Thank you. Anybody else? So, th 
this leads right into Dr. Mark's uh, position and discussion. Barbara Marks, PhD and CEO and founder of Full Circle Institute. We're gonna talk about leadership skills. Question, can you share a comparison on post to present history and a narrative about how we as women think about things which can get us into trouble? Okay, the notion of having it all and what we need to do to change that narrative. Okay, I'm going to start with um, some really ancient history. Uh, 5.30 this morning, <laughs> when I was reading my iPad and eating breakfast at my kitchen table, and I was reading, I don't know why I do this to myself at 5.30 in the morning, but I was reading yet another article about how do we as women succeed in the business world. And as I was reading, it was 10 ideal ways of approaching leadership for women. And they were going through 10 noticings of body language that help women to be perceived more positively as leaders. And the list basically went through a rundown of all of the things that women do that women shouldn't do, that they should do more like men. So women shouldn't smile as much, women shouldn't nod as much, uh, women should not be as uh, assertive in their language. And I'm, and I'm reading this list and I'm saying, wait, yeah, today's it's 26th, right? 2012? And these are the tips that women are getting? about how to succeed as leaders. And I thought, who wrote this article? And, and I go back, and it's, it's, it's a leadership coach. You know, back in the day when I started, I did professional development. Now I'm a leadership coach. <laughs> and it surprises me how much women are, we're still telling each other, don't be so female. Don't be so genuinely uh, collaborative with people. Don't reach out. Don't try to make people feel comfortable. Um, spread your legs, basically. <laughs> Take up more space. And, and so we have been dealing with this gender bias forever. Forever. I'm 61. And, and I, I started working with women back in the, in the mid-1970s helping women survive in business environments. And the gender bias was so boldly present then. I mean, it just, you could, you could look, paw through the air at it. And, and everything that you were talking about, Lori, uh, with regard to how men and women are perceived differently. Um, Sandra Bem um, did studies in the 1970s on, on leadership, you know, that people were asked to describe the perfect leader, describe the ideal male, describe the ideal woman. Well, the woman sounded like a great gal, but clearly leader was male. And that bias, that perception, that, that way of, of experiencing men and women is alive and well this minute. This very minute, it hasn't changed since I started studying it 30 years ago. And it is a little more subtle, it is a little more insidious, but that makes it more difficult to confront. And it's not men and women. I'm not a big battle of the sexes kind of a gal. I, I don't believe it's men and women against each other in the world. I think it is the gender bias that is our issue. And men and women hold that gender bias equally, which is why we have these things that, that you address so beautifully, Lauren, about how women have a difficult time with other women because women are not acting in a way that another woman thinks that person should be acting. So how we end up not being able to promote ourselves is, is that we read articles like this and we believe it, for one thing. And it's like, how in this day and age do you read that you really should not nod if you want to be considered someone who is a leader 
when that's what we do as women. We talk to each other and we nod to acknowledge I'm listening. I don't need a manual on how to be a man. When I first started working with women, women would come into my office and say, I think I'm the only woman in the building. Now women come into my office and they say, I'm the only woman in the boardroom. I may be the only woman in the department. So it's becoming a little bit easier for women because there are more women. And yes, you cannot be what you cannot see. In order for us to be able to see more women, I'm sorry, I took some cold medicine this morning and my mouth is so dry. I'm afraid it's gonna to stick together. So, if we, if we don't aspire and we don't work at getting to the top, if we don't just jump in there and, and do the things that we want to do, and, and this is another thing, we're not supposed to gesture above our heads. Apparently, <laughs> apparently girls gesture above their heads too much and that you really can't do that as a leader and you really need to stay down here. <laughs> and, and so, it used to be <laughs> um, that, that there were very few role models out there. And, and what I do now is I encourage women to just, if you don't see a role model, go, go do, go be. Um, I mentor a lot of young women. In addition to the people that hire me to coach them, um, I just adopt women all over the place. And, and I tend to throw them into the deep end a little bit. And, and I'm right there at the edge of the pool. I mean, I'm not gonna throw them in and say, ha, drown. I'm throwing them in and, and saying, okay, come on, have a good time in there. And it's important that we do not hold ourselves back for fear that we're not going to succeed because if you don't imagine <laughs> succeeding, you cannot succeed. So it's important that we mentor, it's important that we sponsor, it's important that we learn that it's okay to be ourselves because if you try to be something other than yourself, you're not gonna be a good leader because you're gonna stop and think, okay, am I gesturing above my head right now? <laughs> Rather than really thinking, what is the point I want to get across and how do I want to connect with this person and how do I want to influence this person and how sure am I of the idea that I am putting across if I'm worried about whether or not I'm nodding while I'm putting that idea across. <laughs> Athletes do a really marvelous job of visualizing success. So let's imagine that you are a runner and that your primary event are hurdles. Now, if you imagine running your race, and, and you imagine every time you run into a hurdle, it's gonna be a problem. You're probably not going to do as well in that race. Your time probably isn't going to be as good because what's gonna happen is you're going to get up to that hurdle and you're gonna say, oh, here I am at a hurdle. What did I decide about how I was going to get past that hurdle? What was it that I heard that woman say in that leadership talk the other day? What did I hear at that conference about how I'm gonna get past that hurdle? What's important is you see yourself running and jumping over the hurdles. That you see yourself getting a really good time. That you see yourself moving past what were some of your preconceived notions about what was going to hold you back. And then you get together with other people, men and women, and you celebrate with them, your successes. And so I encourage young women to get out into whatever field you're in and see your success and aim there, out there, way out there, and make sure that you get there. Thank you. It's seeing yourself, ladies. Because we know when we gesture above our heads, what are we doing? We raising the roof. <laughs> All right, so keep on pushing it. All right, next we're going to speak with Christy Cortez. She's CEO and founder of Ad Recruiter. Topic focus, career development, and transferring this knowledge to the workforce. Question. 
Please share your thoughts on how quickly society is changing and that old thinking will hurt and hinder your career. Um, talk to us about the hiring managers and how not to become irrelevant or worse yet, overlooked by agencies, top CD, ECDs, and, and search firms. All right, so I'm a recruiter, so there you go, headhunter as you will. And my entire area of expertise over the last decade is talent identification and acquisition for advertising agencies. Uh, and so this is where I'm coming from, and I'm gonna talk to you right now about the front end of being identified and being hired. So that's what I'm addressing. Uh, and you know, many of you that know me, uh, I, I call it being found. Being identified and being hired, I say, be found. Um, and I find that social media is so fundamental in my business as a recruiter that I struggled thinking about what to present to this general assembly and what goes to the social media panel that I'm on. Um, so uh, it's my job to find the very best executives in our cutting edge industry. Uh, many times those are executive creative director placements. And uh, so this makes it my job to stay ahead of traditional recruiting departments at the ad agencies. But I will say that in-house ad agency recruiters with the global big five are hot on my heels in social recruitment. I'm here today to help the 97% increase their chances of being found, of being called into interviews, of being hired into the creative bastion we like to call the old boys club. And there are two mindsets we consistently see that could be improved upon regarding these chances for women creatives getting the big job. And mind you, we also see these mindsets with men, but not as much. And that's very telling. Number one, being a ghost. Not being visible by folks like myself, by top global executive creative directors, and cutting edge in-house recruiters. Lacking a consistent identity across all social media channels. Number two, choosing selectivity and privacy over industry visibility and participation. It's a choice. Um, if you're the 3%, congratulations, you're incredibly talented and gifted, and there's a good chance you've worked your way up through your agency, as we've seen today, or you're an early adapter and you have been found. Um, where's Cindy Gallup? That'd be a perfect example of an early adapter using social. <laughs> um, but we are here to talk about how to break into the old boys club, aren't we ladies? Yep. So let's play for a moment. And let's take a trip to an exclusive gentleman's club in old London, where the titans of the British ad, industry, ad industry hold even more dismal numbers than our 3%. Men go to their exclusive club to read their newspapers, to discuss golf, to debate politics, to drink aged whiskey out of centuries old crystal tumblers, to bond, to be challenged to healthy competition, to be friends outside their formal storied walls. Sounds like a certain social media network, doesn't it? It's where many deals are made, referrals are being given, and recommendations are being discussed and decided. After talent, people hire people they like. For most of you ladies out there who are not in the 3%, Listen very closely. Make friends with the titans you want an in with in social and shine your talent, your creativity, your experience, and your light. And remember, disingenuous networking is not networking. Networking is about the amazingness in others, not in yourself. Uh, and social media is a very effective tool to use to open that clubhouse door, ladies. So friend, follow, invite, socialize, bond, and be found, and join the club. It's up to you. 
It is my hope we mentor other women who do not see this powerful connection at all of our fingertips and encourage them in their ascent to the top. And um, like I, my closing statement is, is who are you not to be great? Ladies, thank you uh, very much. I don't know if we have time for questions, but I wanted to thank these brilliant women and their wonderful insights and let us leave you with, in the words of that great philosopher, Winnie the Pooh, Winnie the Pooh, you're braver than you believe, stronger than you seem, and smarter than you think. Thank you.